Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so we're happy to have Alan Sly here from MSR Redmond and he's going to be talking about the reconstruction problem on the tree. And is this the three hour lecture or was that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um <laughs> Oh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thanks for the uh, opportunity to speak, and I'm glad not everyone uh, fell ill at the sort of <laughs> thought of coming to the talk. But um, I'm going to be talking about sort of the reconstruction problem on the tree, which is kind of a clean probabilistic question, uh, but also because it's related to several different other areas that I'm interested in, and I'll uh, have a chance to tell you about. Okay, so the basic problem will be uh, we'll have a, uh, a Markov model on, on the tree and we want to understand the rate of decay of information in some sense uh, for the model. So we have a, an infinite DRE tree, every vertex has D children, and uh, uh, some finite state Markov chain uh, with Q states and uh, a stationary distribution pi. And the Markov model will just be, uh, you pick the root according to the stationary distribution, and then in each step from a, a parent to a child will just be one step of the Markov chain. And for people who are in social media, for example, is this yeah. going to become a little more, you'll, you'll tell them a little more, yes? Or the motivation? The motivation. Uh, yes. OK, good. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so, okay, and so, so there's a, a random sort of noisy process uh, uh, on this tree, and sort of as you get deeper and deeper down, you have less and less information about uh, the original state at the root. So the question, in a sense, is as, as the depth goes to infinity, is there any information sort of asymptotically retained. Um, so uh, more formally is sort of the mutual information between the, the vector of states at the nth level and the state at the root bounded away from zero as n goes to infinity, or does it converge to zeros as n goes to infinity? Yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah. The whole thing is specified by this one matrix M, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, a matrix M and sort of D, the branching rate of the tree. Okay. Um, okay. So this is the probabilistic question. Oh, oh so sorry. Uh, so along, so from the root, for example, along the two different edges. The matrix M is applied separately on infinity yeah. on the two sides. Yeah. So okay. And sort of along any any verte any ray from the root down to infinity will just be a, a copy of the Markov chain. Is these two conditions equivalent? Uh, yes. So, so there are there are a range of different equivalent uh, formulations of it. Um, on the more technical side, it's whether or not the free Gibbs measure is extreme or, but essentially. You can just think of it as, um, like, is there sort of as you get further and further down, you have you remember less and less about the root in some sense, but there's the tree is branching, so there are sort of the the vector of states you see is grows larger and larger. These sort of there's a trade-off between the two, and so asymptotically, is there some information left? Okay, so the kind of examples uh, I'll be talking about will be um, uh, 
in more in the second half of the talk will be coming from sort of several different areas. Uh, one will be sort of, I guess the the most easily motivated is uh, sort of phylogenetic reconstruction. So this is um, <coughs> you can think of Markov models as kind of the most basic model for uh, mutations of DNA amongst a, a collection of species connected by some ancestral tree. So their, their common ancestor has some you know, character A, G, C, or T, and uh, over time those are mutated. And uh, so this is, um, and so, so this is a, sort of maybe the clearest example of uh, uh, sort of a Markov model. Uh, I'll maybe less obviously is that it's um, related. So what you want is to know what the DNA of Adam was. You have like an extinct species, and you only have yeah. its descendants, and you want to reconstruct its DNA based on the DNAs of current you species. You want to make dinosaurs. Yeah. You want to do Jurassic Park. <laughs> also, maybe get the yeah. tree, not only the DNAs. Right, okay, and, um, and so this is maybe jumping ahead to um, what I'll be speaking about a bit later on, but yeah, so one question is the, what can you say about the uh, state of the root, and how does this relate to, say, recovering the phylogenetic question, which is recovering the underlying tree? Um, okay. Um, and yeah, uh, and I'll also relate. Oh. I mean, just it's recovering the, the root is not special. If you can recover the root, you can. Sh you should be able to recover anything, everything. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, say you don't know the underlying structure of the tree. Uh, can you recover the sort of topology of it? Okay. Uh, also talk about the relationship to. Uh, random constraint satisfaction problems, and I'll give a. I'll also give the five-minute version of the three-hour talk from <laughs> uh, yesterday about how it relates to uh, certain uh, combinatorial counting problems. Okay, uh, but to begin, but to begin with, I just wanted to uh, talk a bit about uh, thresholds for the uh, reconstruction problem. Okay, and so the mo the simplest kind of channels you could look at may well maybe a uh, symmetric ones. Um, well. So these will be uh, Markov chains where all the states are sort of symmetric with respect to each other. So the transition matrix will be just. So the fact that now you call them channels does it mean I should think of coding theory? Uh, yeah, this is just me being inconsistent in notation, <laughs> I guess. Uh, partly because, yeah, partly because the problem's been looked at from different fields and uh, these slides have been constructed from different talks. And uh, <laughs> so, but, this was but this question. So is, is yeah. it true sure. that it has some relationships to coding series? That's why um, it's called channel. Yeah, this mm. would be the exact transition yeah. probability of the purely symmetric mm -hmm. channel. Yeah. Coding mm. theory. Yeah. You can think maybe mm. of a message that is sent by the root and is corrupted mm. and you want to recover it, I guess. Yeah. Maybe that's yeah. Mm. And you make it up with words. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, so in this case, I'll. So the transition matrix will be constant on the diagonal and constant off the diagonal. And it's convenient to parameterize it by uh, the second eigenvalue of the, the Markov chain, so which I'll call theta. Um, and this is just equivalent to saying one step of the Markov chain with probability theta keeps the previous value, and with probability 1 minus theta chooses a, a uniformly random choice from the all q possible states. Um, Okay, and the, the problem is monotone in theta, so there's a critical value theta c, so that you have reconstruction above this level and non-reconstruction below it. So, by which I mean you can recover asymptotic information above theta c and not below it. 
Okay. Uh, so just yes, yes, thanks, uh, and Q as well. Um, okay. So the mo. Okay. So just as a sort of simple exercise, uh, like another formulation of the model is you can say we'll delete edges independently with uh, probability one minus theta and split the tree up into sort of a, a family of subtrees. Uh, and then you can think of the model as giving each cluster a, a uniformly chosen value. And, and so an easy bound from this is that when theta times d is less than or equal to 1, uh, then you must have non-reconstruction because this is the regime in which all of the components of the, uh, this tree with the deleted edges will be finite almost surely. And so if there is no pass from the root to any limit. Yeah. And so, it, so there's no way for information to reach sort of deep within the tree. Uh, just any of the edges of the tree independently at random with probability 1 minus theta. D? D is the branching rate of the tree. Uh, and Q is the number of states of the, the Markov chain. Okay. But this, um, but having infinite components sort of isn't sufficient because if they're not big enough, they can uh, just be lost in the noise potentially because you don't you don't get to see which uh, component was is connected to the root. Okay. So. Uh, maybe the most important bound in, in this area is the so-called Kessen-Stigen bound, which says that when uh, theta squared times d is greater than 1, uh, then, you have, uh, then you can do reconstruction. And it's sufficient in that case just to look at the uh, frequencies of the states uh, within the level you're looking at. So in this case, how many zeros and ones you see. And, and this will do, sort of, and just say choosing the state that has the maximum frequency is a, a better estimate of the, the root than random chance sort of independent of the, the depth of the tree. And this is independent of Q at this stage? Yes. So getting a, a yeah. This is in fact uh, in completely independent of the, this will hold for any reversible Markov chain, so where Theta is the its second eigenvalue, um, and and if you only look at the the frequencies, uh, this is tight. So you uh, you can't do better when theta squared times d is less than one. Um, the re the place where this sort of bound comes in is it's the point at which the component containing the root. Um, its intersection with the nth row is in expectation of larger order than square root of the size of the nth row. So it's big enough to overcome kind of any central limit theorem type random fluctuations. Um, but in the full problem, you potentially have more information, not just uh, how the vertice, uh, not just how many vertices states you have, but how they're arranged within the row. So there's potentially more information. Uh, okay, so the basic question I want to address in the first half of the talk is when is the kessen stigen bound tight? So, so the first answer is that uh, when Q equals 2, it is. Um, so you have non-reconstruction when theta squared times d is less than or equal to 1. And there are, there are multiple proofs of this. And, um, and but there's even earlier work by um, Jennifer on a, on a related spin glass model, um, which I think motivated um, maybe the first, well, some or all of the proofs uh, of the result. Um, and, uh, and it's also tight for sort of slightly asymmetric channels, um, two state ones where. Uh, the stationary distribution is close enough to a half a half. Um, so, 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 Q is small, this is some, somehow tending 
theta is tending to be the smallest, is it? So uh, the critical theta is tending to be the smallest. Uh, uh, no, it's tending to be l larger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, I mean, for a while, uh, it was conjectured that maybe this should be the right bound for all Markov chains. And I think Yuval gave that to Elkanan as a thesis problem. <laughs> uh, but it, it, <laughs> it turns out not to be true. And, uh, and when you have a large <laughs> number of states, uh, the bound isn't tight. Um, and the reason is, because there are more different kinds of states, you can uh, come up with more combinatorial uh, sort of reconstruction methods. Um, okay. Um, so, so then it was thought. So this is in the infinite uh, DRV three. Yeah. Uh, symmetric uh, channel. Yeah. So these are all kind of asymptotic results in. This is, very this is this is for symmetric. So this is very surprising. So, no, that's mm -hmm. it. No. No. So, so the thing is, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> somewhat surprising. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it was what's well, surprising to you, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so yeah. It seems like I mean, when you have the roots saying it's a zero, mm. and then the next guys mm. have only the option is either being mm. zero, which is consistent with the root, or being one, which is mm. the only other way of confusing you, mm. they tend to sort of confuse you more convincingly. Mm -hmm. If the others can now sort of pick a random number mm. between one and two minus one, mm -hmm. Mm. then each one is sort of influenced, you know, sort of putting less to the confusion. Right? Okay. okay. So, sorry. So, so you could take it a bit further and say, what if actually Q was infinite? So you just get a, a different state each time you, you do a step. Then, then the sort of percolation bound of theta d equals 1 is the right bound. Because essentially, if you see if the root was in one state and, say, state 0, and you saw a 0 in two different subtrees of it, then the root would have to be a 0. And so somehow, two is on one side of the um, things, and eighteen is on the other. Um, and so it's thought, well, it's thought for a while that maybe just q equals two was the special case because uh, none of the uh, sort of previous proofs uh, sort of worked in uh, for that. Uh, but Mazard and Montanari uh, worked on the problem and using Sort of non. Sorry, is that too low? I guess. Um, well, sorry. Uh, sorry for the room. Yeah. <laughs> um, that when uh, that actually the prediction should be uh, uh, it should be tight when q is less than or equal to four and not tight when q is greater than or equal to five. But these were. It's good that DNA only has four states. <laughs> <laughs> Actually well, maybe uh, bad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, depend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or if you want to know about the past, or that's best to. It's good we can't reconstruct dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so these these were based on uh, sort of numerical simulations, and so don't don't really answer why four or five should be the, the right number of states. So, um, I would have guessed without thinking from a statistical physics background that without numerical calculations and four is a Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, when I gave the, so this talk at MIT, Scott asked, uh, is there Four is also the critical number of states for the, the POTS model. Is there any connection right. there? Um, don't know. I, I, mean, I mean, that would be that would be why he said his physics yeah. background would tell. Because yeah. four happens to be special. The four state POTS model is mm. special for other reasons, with transitions changing from first to second order. So yeah. So it's, it's, it's important mm. in phase transitions. Mm. Um, 
this may be more of a coincidence, I think. Mm. But, uh, or no, no, I, so. no, I just can't sure. spell. Well, it turns out it means the art of proclaiming or preaching. <laughs> 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 Are you So just to summarize for, I guess, for Q on the x-axis, the number of states, and theta squared d on the y-axis, you have reconstruction above 1. It's tight for Q equals 2. There are various bounds for other values of Q, but none of them were tight in terms of when you have reconstruction versus non-reconstruction. <coughs> OK. So uh, I guess. My results, uh, I guess, established um, uh, a number of the uh, predications of uh, <laughs> Mazard <laughs> and Montanari. <laughs> um, in the case of Q equals 3, uh, the bound is tight, uh, at least when D is large enough. Um, so you have non-reconstruction when theta squared times D is less than or equal to 1. And when Q is greater than or equal to 5, it's uh, never tight uh, for any value of D. And it's also not tight in an asymptotic sense. So D is the branching factor, is the yes. factor yeah. So theta C squared times D converges to a constant which you can calculate, which is strictly less than 1. Do you know uh, this constant tends where Q goes to infinity? Is that thing tight or something? Mm. No, no, no. I can't. Yeah. 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 It has to be inconsistent with the other. Yeah. And so why is it large D? Wouldn't small D make reconstruction? Um, wouldn't large D make reconstruction a little easier? Um, okay. But you have set as square times D. Yeah. So. Oh, I see. Okay. So it's bound to be zero. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, res the reason for large D is because that's what I can prove. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'll. need some Yeah. Um, but it's. There's every reason to believe that it, it holds for all D in the Q equals 3 case. Um, okay. Yeah. So, and, and in the. Q equals 4 case remains completely open, and, uh, but it's at least tight in an asymptotic sense. Okay. So at least asymptotically, we can sort of say exactly what the reconstruction and non-reconstruction regimes are. Okay. So... So you actually now show the theorem which you hadn't stated. That they match... No, I mean... No. It's the same thing. No, it's just that this was just an asymptotic statement. So for each for each value of Q, I can tell you asymptotically where the thresholds are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to give you a extremely high-level outline of the proof, and this will be the only proof that I'll um, give in the talk. Um, it's based on estimating a, a quantity which I think I think goes back to Jennifer's original paper of the, on the magnetization. So this is... I call that the prehistoric spin glass. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Keston and Stigham's paper is... Uh, is even, even more prehistoric, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> okay. So, so this is the, um, well, it's the expected posterior probability that the root is 1 where, given level n, where you, the distribution of level n is chosen from the root actually being 1, minus 1 on q. And just to pass what that really means, it's how much more likely you to think, are you going to think that the root is a 1 given that it actually was? Um, 
and it turns out to be a good way of sort of measuring information. It's always positive. And you have non-reconstruction if and only if it converges to zero. Uh, but there's no nice uh, formula or recursion for this. Um, there's a recursive structure to the reconstruction problem, but it's really recursions of uh, vector value distributions, which are not simple objects to do recursions for. Um, but there are at least two settings in which uh, you can say things about this. The first is what happens when it's uh, small. Uh, so this corresponds to the case where there's little information about the root. All the posterior probabilities uh, are close to uniform. And so, so you can essentially plug the recursion of vector value distributions into Bayes' rule. Um, do a bunch of Taylor series expansions, concentration estimates, mm -hmm. and, and sort of a lot of calculations later you get uh, this formula. So there's, yeah, so uh, in the Borg's Chase Moslin Rock paper there was a, a similar calculation. Um, but there I guess getting the second order term exactly wasn't necessary um, here um, because somehow because q equals 2 is further away from the critical number of states um, and so with this expansion um, we calculate the sort of exact second order term and the key well the key point about the recursion is that uh, the first order term, d theta squared, is just 1 uh, at the kessen stegen bound. And uh, so the sign of the second order coefficient will be critical, and it has a, a multiplicative factor of q minus 4. So this kind of explains why 4 is the, the right number of states. But, but this, is only a, uh, this only holds for small values of xn. So it's enough when q is greater than or equal to 5 to say that the kessen stegen bound isn't sharp because xn uh, uh, won't converge to 0 because xn plus 1 is, will be greater than xn for small values. But it doesn't say that it ever actually becomes small because sort of much can be hidden in the error term at the end of the equation. But if it's not small, then you construct. Um, Right, so I, when Q, so I want to say for the, the yeah. It's trying to prove non construction. Yeah, sort right. of. So this does prove for Q greater than 5, yeah. reconstruction, right. but he's yeah. trying to prove non-reconstruction. So this is one of the theorems that yeah. already, so, the, yeah. so, the, so right. this already gives you one of the theorems that was yeah. not known before, right. that uh, for K, yeah. Q equal right. larger than 5, yeah. uh, right. you can beat the case okay, so by. Right, but it doesn't yeah. automatically violate mm. the Mm. You're trying to do four or like three? Uh, three, say. So three. Four, four is especially hard because right. here the second order term is zero. And so in principle, one ought to be able to get sort of even further terms. But they're, um, they're things which are, are neglib negligible in this case uh, are probably not negligible in. Um, so, and I. Uh, yeah. uh, so the the other setting in which uh, you so can, can you remind me? so in this case, what can you use this recursion to prove? So you can can you calculate the exact value for large Q of the threshold using this recursion? Uh, no. Can you so give you a one-way bound which is sharp? Um, so you. This will combine with. Uh, the next thing I'm going to say to, so. So by itself, it doesn't give you. Much. Yeah, it gives you the q the, that it's not tight for q greater than or equal to five, but that's that's basically it. And now you're getting large yeah. d for the other. Yeah. Side. Yeah. And so what happens when d is large, is that um, so the corresponding values of theta are, will be small, so essentially there's very little information traveling across each edge of the graph. And, and by the Markov structure of the model, Q 
conditional on the root. What happens in each of the subtrees attached to the root are conditionally independent. So it's in a sense a question about aggregating lots of small conditionally independent bits of information. Uh, so one can, um, and so adding up lots of small independent things suggests there should be some kind of central limit theorem. And, uh, and you can uh, prove uh, some kind of a result like that for the posterior probabilities and write xn sort of plus one as some function gq of xn where the approximation gets better and better as, uh, yeah. Um, and so the central limit term is for n goes to infinity, but it gets, but uh, is d for goes to infinity. Yeah, as for, la I mean, it's uh, an approximation that gets better and better for larger values of d. Um, mm -hmm. And and so then the, the key point would be, what are the, the fixed points of this equation? So x equals g of x. And when q is greater than or equal to 5, there are uh, strictly positive fixed points. And when q is less than or equal to 4, x equals 0 is the only fixed point. So first of all, this gives sort of asymptotics for the threshold when, uh, uh, as d goes to infinity. Uh, but in the case of q equals 3, when uh, for large d, it will, uh, it will show that eventually xn will be quite small, small enough that you can apply the, the first analysis and uh, show that it actually converges to 0. So, um, OK. So, so that's all the proving that I wanted to do for today. Uh, I mean, why are there many small conditionally independent pieces of information? Um, so, in a sense, if you, uh, okay, I can't write things can, down, you can but lift this and then let me see if just take the first level subtree, just the children yeah, of the root. Yeah. yeah, so you have information about each of the children of the root, and they're all con their states are all conditionally independent and you want to sort of aggregate that information to say, what does that tell you about the root? Why small? Um, because theta is small if d is large, and theta squared times d is equal to 1. So what does it mean for theta to be small if d is large? You're saying in order to, for it to okay. be less equal to 1? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so the relevant theta we're interested in is the like 1 over the square root of d, I guess. Right, OK. So, so yeah. Uh, and that and that corresponds to basically not much information acro traveling across each branch of the tree. Uh, okay. So. Um, so the next uh, thing which I we sort of envisioned earlier in the talk was. Uh, uh, what happens. Uh, uh, or the question of phylogenetic reconstruction, uh, of which yes, Costas is one of the experts. Um, and so, uh, so in this setting, the reconstruction problem would be sort of a question of what is Adam or the common ancestor of a bunch of species, uh, what's its state? But usually the more interesting question is uh, given a, a sort of given the present day species or the the leaves of the tree um, and and their states, uh, can you reconstruct the underlying Markov model that that generated them and so one copy of the Markov model is clearly insufficient, but say I give you multiple in, uh, independent copies um, how many uh, how many do you need in order to Reconstruct the the generating model uh, with high probability. In copies, you're going to get multiple copies of the DNAs of the birds and so on. Is that yeah, right? of of the leaves of the tree of the sort of present day species. Multiple positions. And these were these would correspond. The DNA, right? Yeah, yeah. So these would, roughly speaking, correspond to multiple sites on the genome. 
Uh, so like that every position in the DNA is independently uh, uh, mutated and, and mm -hmm. you, you look uh, at K of them and that gives you like a... That's the yeah. simplest That's and then yeah. they look at, at more. Yeah. So Tandy Warnow had talked a lot about this. She yeah. visited last semester. Okay. So. But it's not the same thing as, generate, as generating a complete sample through the Pontar tree. It. So, why not? so you generate a sample from the model, and then another one, mm. you put it together in a sequence. Uh, For the simplest model. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I was just going to read tree. Okay, sure, sure. Um. Okay. Um, so uh, these two problems are related, and you've probably heard Sebastian or Costas or Elkanan uh, talk about these results a, a bunch of times. So I'll just uh, briefly, well, in half a slide, tell you the story again. Uh, so when you're in the when the tree is in the non-reconstruction regime, so uh, you need you require a large number of samples, so polynomial in the number of leaves of the tree, and and the reason essentially is uh, there's very li you don't retain much information about the states of the vertices closest to the root, so just on information theoretic grounds to determine the relationship between the um, most distant ancestors, you need uh, a large number of samples and sort of quantitative estimates of the sort of rate of decay of information in the, the reconstruction problem that sort of give you that a, a polynomial number of samples is required. But this uh, isn't an issue in the reconstruction regime. You can potentially get sort of some information even about the most di um, distant ancestors. Uh, and in that case, uh, it turned out that a logarithmic number of samples was required. And in, in the case of general binary trees, uh, um, uh, with, was done by Costas, uh, um, Elkanan, and Sebastian. Yeah. Is this assuming unlimited possible sites? Um, that doesn't show up here. No, the number of sites is the sample. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so N, sorry. So capital N here is the number of leaves of the tree, and this is how many samples. So, samples. so, you, so you assume that it's a, a binary tree with n leaves, but you just don't know on the permutation. You're given these guys, um, and you don't know how to. Well, it, it doesn't. Them it to doesn't. The tree. It doesn't have to be a symmetric tree. It can be any, it's any not binary. complete. It's not complete. Yeah. No. Just. So you have like a, some subset of the leaves, and, uh, uh, and no, you, you have. Want to know you have to I mean, it's you want like it could, yeah. Okay. Right, it doesn't have uh, to be a. Right. Any binary tree. It's not flat. Ah, okay. Uh, right, they don't all have the same number, um, same number of generations because the mm. mutation rate okay. is not mm. the same along the various branches. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, we don't need it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. Okay. Um, Sorry. Which of these regimes are we actually in? <laughs> <laughs> the Q larger than two, for starters. <laughs> so well, people are hoping. I mean, people try to do reconstruction. No, I mean, so you can do back in the middle calculation. So, so where so is the threshold for two? Is like one zero point eleven. So it's a large mutation rate. So we're, we're mm. probably in the re at least there exist sites. There exist division of many mm. sites that are within the reconstruction regime. We hope so, yeah. Right. Mm. That that's what all these reconstructions are based on. That we're, yeah. we're assuming we are. It seems, it seems pretty confident uh, actually that we're in that regime, right? Yes. Yeah. I guess it's I also true that different bunch of sites which are just not mutating. I mean, yeah. yeah. That should be no information about the tree. Right. So yeah. I've, I've kind of left he, out that condition. Yeah. Just he's the, he's he's gotten so he's, he's be left be out all the provisos about with probability blah blah so blah. Yeah. Which which take into account your your concerns. Yeah. So you choose non coding regions to do the reconstruction because yeah. the mm. selected ones are not going to be Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I mean, to have like some probability of change, in the not too not too high, high, but also not too small. Of, uh, right. And, uh, you yeah, and, yeah, you and, and, the and the then you really have like a clock. Mm. Right, but what he's mm. but but what he's leaving out is that you know if he's picking like a random set or whatever of mm. log n samples, not yeah. there yeah. exist sets of log n samples that are not going to do it. For no, 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 I yeah. think I do is right. If you if you if had for example, so so c here is, here is really a, a right. function of theta, right. uh, yeah. and it yes. yeah. 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 yeah yeah okay um, so. Well, I'll just mention uh, a couple of things I've looked at uh, um, in this area. One was for <coughs> fairly general uh, channels, and so so this was joint work with Sebastian and Alcanan, sort of recovering the. Um, okay, so there are sort of at least for for more general channels, uh, there are. Um, it's uh, the pictures, I guess, not as completely fully understood, um, particularly if uh, the theta for each of the edges is allowed to vary in a continuous um, range of parameters. Um, so you can ask, given the topology of the tree, can you uh, recover all of the thetas on each of the edges? And with a, a logarithmic number of samples, if you're in the keston stegem reconstruction regime. Um, and so, so we can do that. We've also looked at the problem of phylogenetic reconstruction, um, sort of for where Q is larger. And so then the keston stegem bound isn't the the threshold as it is in the binary case. And that turns out not to be a barrier. So you can um, do the phylogenetic question, at least in some cases, even sort of when theta squared d is less than 1, if you're still in the reconstruction regime. So you still need to be greater than theta c, but it's yeah. not. Uh, yeah, if it's less than theta c, then. Uh, you'll be in the situation of needing a large number of samples again. So that's a general proof, uh, that's for, uh, not just for the binary symmetric channel, that uh, theta less than theta c you can't do. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And finally, the most recent thing that we're well, just starting to write down now is understanding the problem for uh, maximum likelihood estimation, which is in practice, I think, what a large number of people doing this sort of reconstruction actually use. Um, okay. The estimation of the tree's topology? Uh, yeah, so what, um, yeah, finding the tree that maximizes the, the likelihood function. So what's, what's, what's the question here? Uh, here the question would be, um, well, given if you find, is the maximum likelihood tree the, the true one, essentially. Uh, so and then also questions of, uh, and it will be, with a, a logarithmic number of samples. And then the other question would be, actually, can you find it efficiently? But the fact that another algorithm also finds the true tree, and the true tree is the maximum likelihood tree, says that at least the computational question of whether or not you can find it is the, an uh, the answer is yes. So, um, okay. So are there situations where the true tree is not the maximum likelihood tree? Uh, n uh, we don't. We don't know any. So, it do we think so? Or I, the question is, how many samples you need? To right. Be yeah. Certain that the I mean, the we don't. I mean, in general, yeah. if there is if, some if construction, it's always the maximum likelihood. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so obviously if you have fewer number of samples than log n, then, then it could just be whatever tree. But our results are consistent with uh, maximum likelihood being sort of the right thing to do when there's enough information to recover something. Well, I say this is still like in the writing down uh, process. Okay. Uh, 
All right, so I was going to move on and talk about um, other, other places where the reconstruction problem comes up. Um, okay, so maybe more surprisingly is it turns up in problems of uh, random constraint satisfaction problems. So uh, these will be problems like random KSAT, um, but I'll talk about uh, just to pick a s simple example, random colorings on random regular graphs. Um, and I'm sure um, Ricardo Zacchina or Andrea Montanari, when they've been here, have talked about this. But I'll just briefly talk about how the problems are related. Uh, because the reconstruction uh, threshold here turns out to play a key role. So you can think of. Uh, the set of solutions um, or colorings of a, a random graph as, um, as having some structure given by saying two colorings are adjacent if they just differ at a single vertex. And so uh, in this way, you can ask, what are the connected components of uh, uh, proper colorings of the graph? And the sort of height. And the, the physics picture is that there's... Uh, what, what was it called, a predication? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the... <laughs> yeah, okay. So it's predicted to undergo uh, uh, a sequence of phase transitions. And maybe the most interesting one is uh, a sort of clustering or shattering one, which is uh, uh, and that there's a, a critical degree, dc, so that if, if d is less than that, almost all of the colorings are in uh, a single giant component. And above that, they split into exponentially many um, smaller components. What are the blue things the versus the pink? Um, they, they, cor um, they correspond to different sorts of phase transitions. These are... Um, Frozen clusters. So, in this, uh, blue are frozen. So that which would mean some. Uh, what else? Yeah. Um, so, so the non-pink ones are are frozen in the sense that almost all of the colorings in those um, clusters, are, most of the vertices are fro uh, are all the same in every coloring within that cluster. Um, and, and that's more important for, say, this transition, um, which is basically the point at which all of them become frozen. Um, each one of these transitions have a name, like the reconstruction threshold? Like <laughs> uh, the physicists have yeah. given several of them names. Yeah, so one, I one, is, anyway. one is kind of a freezing one. This is a, a condensation one, so... Um, what is the first one called? The first one I haven't heard a name for. Uh, so, so that's like when Achliopters talks about the shattering thing, he talks this about... This is this one. This one. Yeah. And, and how is it related to reconstruction? Okay. So the conjectured threshold is just given by a, a reconstruction threshold. So it will be the the reconstruction threshold for colorings on trees. Uh, so, so random graphs are like locally tree-like. Um, and so I guess, and loc at, least, at least for most of this spectrum until maybe this point, if you look at the, the local measure of colorings around a vertex, it should just look like the uniform distribution of colorings uh, in that neighborhood. And then the reconstruction problem essentially says, is the color at a vertex related to the distant colors um, or the colors of distant vertices, um, which is somehow re like related to whether or not it's a, a local problem or not. Um, and the conjecture is that the, the reconstruction threshold for the sort of deregular tree or, uh, should, should give you the, the right bound for this threshold. 
Okay. Um, and so you can just think of uh, colorings on trees as a, another symmetric channel. In this case, sort of the, the color of, of a child is uniformly chosen to be different to the color of the pa its parent. Uh, so the keston stigenbaum bound says that you have reconstruction when the um, uh, d is greater than k minus 1 squared. But this turns out to be a long way off the, the right threshold. Because um, you can do much better with a, a much simpler type of algorithm. So uh, in this case, we have three colors, blue, red, and green. Um, so if you look at the leftmost vertex, in this case, it has a, a blue child and a red child. So you can be absolutely certain that it has to be green. The middle vertex um, could either be blue or red. So we can just leave that as uncertain. And the rightmost vertex has to be red. And now the root you can um, has a green child and a, a red child with 100% certainty, so it has to be blue. So, so at least some of the time, you can exactly reconstruct the root. This with is actually somewhat like opposite. This algorithm actually demonstrates that there is a construction, but the construction mm. actually corresponds to when the problem is hard, right? Yeah. Yeah, because it's in some sense hard because it depends on things a long way away. Um, okay, and so Mosul and Perez and Semijan worked out the point at which this algorithm works with positive probability independent of the depth of the tree. And it's basically a bit bigger than k log k. So this is, which comes from the coupon collector problem, sort of, you need to see all the other colors with good probability. And then you need a bit extra to make sure you don't get too many question marks building up. And yes. Uh, and somewhat amazingly, this is the, the best known sort of result in terms of when you have reconstruction for this model. Even though it's a, a completely simple algorithm, you're throwing away sort of the fact that you know that this vertex isn't green, uh, but no, no analysis sort of does any better than this. And, and it turns out to be extremely close to the right threshold. And, uh, and so the, I showed non-reconstruction uh, sort of with this bound. And the difference is just in the second order, or, sorry, the third order asymptotic term. Um, and essentially, there's uh, when you uh, yeah. yeah so this is as k goes to infinity. That's amazing. So uh. so although it looks like there's information you're throwing away, you say you really there's not much. There's not much there. That's well, yeah. Just yeah. entropy of two. No, it's actually not. not yeah, little. I was just thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually not li uh, little o in terms of. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and so, essentially, there's in this case there's just enough uncertainty that it then starts accumulating sort of exponentially uh, quickly, and eventually there's nothing left known about the root. It's only when you have this very sort of structured uh, sort of situation where you have a great amount of certainty about each of the states that you can do reconstruction. So that, that should correspond to that, that the problem should be easy to color with these many colors? Um, yeah, yeah. So I just say that so the bounds on the reconstruction, this threshold that this gives uh, consistent with the um, clustering for clustering or shattering thresholds for the coloring on random regular graphs. So we know algorithmic results. When you are below the shattering threshold, are there algorithms which work for coloring? Um, not, well, so I guess it's not, 
So it's known that both of these sort of two regimes exist by work of Archaeopteryx, but somehow the exact point of the transition and isn't known, or even that there's a sort of simple transition where it goes from one to the other at some point and can't. So, but if you if you're okay with sort of one plus little o of one multiplicative factors, um, then it's known that you can find colorings uh, sort of below the threshold, and there are no algorithms that provably find colorings uh, above the threshold. And it's a question of like there's the question of does will survey propagation or that kind of those kind of message passing algorithms uh, succeed. Right. So just for mm. some people in the audience here, the types of algorithms that we're using in computational biology for like the cancer stuff mm. are supposed to are work. supposed to work up mm. to there, and this is but past the threshold. Past it, yeah. So. Yeah. So that well. So, so uh, up to the third box on the left. Yes. Once you have frozen, I think they're not supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. But there are there are questions about that. Where do those work up to? So yeah. Well, uh, mathematically, the question. Well, mathematically, <laughs> there's nothing. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if there's even good algorithms to say sample from the distribution, even sort of close to the threshold of this side. Make sure what I, I understand what's coming the next slide. Yeah. Um, the the non-reconstruction found that's yeah. for this particular algorithm, or that's for any algorithm. For any algorithm. So the I the analogy. Sure um, just so so it's saying that there's not enough information. But right. did you show uh, that uh, any two colorings are equally probable, or how do you? Um, just that the information is not going to be retained. It's so you can, I mean, you can again study uh, the the magnetization um, and some, yeah, and there are, there it's maybe more subtle. Uh, Type of analysis and different, like less Taylor series expansions and more sort of inequalities using the kind of um, the fact the symmetries of the model. So uh, I think the threshold was more uh, whether this is a computational threshold or a information theoretic threshold. No, I understand it's an information theoretic yeah. threshold. Yeah. Mm. That was the first thing we did. Okay. So is I I actually am confused now too. Okay. So your results work for the random graph, or do they just work for uh, trees? This, this is the, the result for the tree. Uh, there are yeah, so there, but there are results by Prasad, Andrea, and Restrepo, uh, saying that the, so you, the reconstruction problem defined in some sense on the random graph gives you the same threshold. Um, but it's not, yeah, yeah, no, no, not at all. It was, um, this is but just. It's kind of, their, their result kind of verifies the, um, the folk theorem about the mm. tree telling you something about other graphs because these things are locally tree -like. Yeah, no, I mean, this is. So yeah. is that just something the along the lines, you, you start with the color at some Mm. given vertex and yeah, then you choose sort of a set of vertices far away and mm. then you can reconstruct or not depending on that threshold yeah. for the random graph. Yeah. And if you can't yeah. reconstruct and that's a good thing. Yeah. Hopefully. It okay. Yeah. Um, and you have to take the limits in the right order and that sort of thing <laughs> but um, to make to make sense of that, but yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. And so the last thing that I'll problem that I'll mention in relation to the reconstruction problem is one about counting independent sets on graphs. So uh, just an, an independent set is a subset of vertices so that it doesn't have any two adjacent vertices. Um, and the the discrete hardcore model is a uh, 
probability distribution over independent sets, where you, you weight an independent set according to lambda to the power of its size. So if lambda is 1, this is just the, the uniform distribution over independent sets. And so there's, a, of course, a, a normalizing constant in the um, formula, z. And if, for those of you who can read the bottom row of the slides, it's, uh, it's just given by a, a weighted sum of, of independent sets, or it's just the number of independent sets when lambda is 1. And this is what we'd like to calculate, or at least approximately calculate. You'd want it, even though probably everybody who doesn't know what an independent set is is lost by now, but maybe you could still define it for us. You said it. Yeah. But oh, you said it. Okay, yeah, so a, yeah, a subset of the vertices, no two of which are connected by an edge. So, uh, so for so example, on the grid, yeah. you're not allowed to have two, um, two adjacent sites occupied. Or that's yeah. not allowed to have two adjacent sites. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, but just before getting to that, you can also define the reconstruction problem on the tree for the hardcore model. Uh, there's a sort of unique translation invariant way of extending the hardcore model to the infinite deregular tree. Um, so it has all the symmetries you'd like, and this is another mark of model. So you can ask, what's the threshold in this case? And the, there was some previous work, uh, Brightwell and Winkler gave sort of another one of these quite simple reconstruction algorithms and showed that log squared times d is sufficient. Um, and James Martin had uh, sort of a, a non-reconstruction result saying that if lambda was less than just the constant e minus 1, that was implied non-reconstruction. And again, it turned out that um, sort of the simple algorithm seems to give... Gave like the, the eigenvalue thing, that the, the probability will stay the same or something? Lambda, oh sorry, lambda is the parameter of the hardcore model. So, yeah. Lambda's big means higher densities of independent sets, uh, which in... Ah, that should imply reconstruction. That should yeah. imply long-term correlation. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, and, and we showed that log squared o d over log log d times a constant was um, sort of an, a bound on the reconstruction regime, with, so with Butnagar and Tetley, and so... Wait, for large d, that's worse than the multi -bound. Uh, no. No. It log, log squared of D oh, over that's log a bigger, log. That's a bigger region. The yeah. thing is just For the, the non-region. Yeah. I mean, and look, yeah. and look at the bound on the other side. It's, so it's close it's to yeah. leading order the same okay, yes. as the reconstruction bound. Yeah. So, and so, again, kind of the, the, e sharp. Yeah, the easy algorithm... Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now the reconstruction threshold was kind of uh, saying, given a sort of average case configuration on level n, do you have a non-trivial amount of information at the root? You can also ask, is there any configuration on the nth level which gives you a non-trivial amount of information about the root? And this would be equivalent to the reconstruction threshold, which is sort of an easier one to calculate, generally, um, at least on trees. And, and for the hardcore model, there's a, an explicit formula for it. And this turns out to be the, the threshold at which um, it was conjectured that it becomes hard to approximate independent sets. So are you saying the weakness threshold should be the same as the reconstruction? Threshold? No, sorry, they're not the same. So, 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 so in particular, could, yeah, this is different to... No, but I'm confused because no, because you the thought the reconstruction, reconstruction no, 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 because reconstruction seems to grow with D and uh, uniqueness shrinks with D. Uh, yes. So. Uh, so you need lambda to be. So if lambda yeah. is greater than this lambda sub u, then. 
there is some boundary condition which influences the route. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, which, is, which makes sense. Not a typical no. one, but right. some. But that does why does mean you can reconstruct? Why does reconstruction shrink with... Uh, why, why the, so that makes sense why uniqueness may be shrink with D. Uh. Why does reconstruction go with D now? I'm confused. Yeah, I, um... Because you have more information than down at the bottom. No, so the, um... Now this is a, a good point, which I was, I guess, maybe glossing over. But, I mean, you did... So the, if you r just restricted to say, so this would be, okay, say if you took the three array tree and just looked at its projection onto a, a two array tree, for the previous models I'd, I've been talking about, you you just, that would give you, uh, that would take it from one, uh, you just have the same Markov model. But here if you, here, if you if you restrict to a, a smaller subtree, it's um, it's not the same model in, uh, or not the same mark of transition rates. So, this is in a <coughs> in a sense why the threshold. So you you'd expect the threshold, the reconstruction threshold to, or the reconstruction regime to be growing, if uh, if you let d become larger just maybe be lambda is not the right parameter somehow yeah so la lambda is not the right parameter really uh, to understand this but uh, this is this is the parameter so what is this do we know what the second eigenvalue is of your Markov chain in terms of lambda uh, I mean there's a formula for it and, and that then makes this reconstruction threshold look more normal yeah <laughs> <laughs> And but I have to look up the paper and tell you what they are. Um, okay. So anyway, the the reconstruction threshold here, I guess, was just a bit of an aside because that's what I. Well, okay. The reconstruction problem will come back again when I give you the um, sort of ninety sesh ninety second version of the proof. But. Um, the yeah so the uniqueness threshold will be the uh, the right the point at which the problem becomes computationally hard so in particular um, well the conjecture turned out to be true so White's showed that when lambda is less than the uniqueness threshold on the D regular tree then there's a deterministic polynomial time algorithm for approximating the partition function um, on all graphs of maximum degree D using I guess a, like a really beautiful uh, computational tree approach. Uh, essentially yeah. It is yeah. really, yeah. yeah. What did you say, uh, it's this it's algorithm. Propagation. Propagation. I mean it was realized yeah. later that Whites was really doing mm. a beautiful version of belief problem. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's what this yeah. computational tree yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And. Uh, so, is it fair to say that. I think it's fair to say that his CM proves that belief propagation works in that regime. Mm -hmm. Because belief propagation on the original graph is the same as the okay. full equilibrium on the computation tree which he proved to be correct in that regime. Yeah. That wasn't the way he viewed yeah. it, but yeah. Yeah. reinterpretation. Yeah. Okay. Um, and my result sort of deals with the other regime where uh, lambda is bigger than the uniqueness threshold um, and that unless NP equals RP, there's no polynomial time approximation. Uh, there's a for annoying technical reasons, it doesn't go for all lambda greater than the uniqueness threshold. This is like a second moment method argument, and if you knew that a function was achieved its maximum in the right place, then you could sort of remove the condition. But I guess 
the two the two main sort of take home messages from this result are that the the phase transition gives the correct computational threshold. The uniqueness phase transition. Yeah. I mean the yeah. 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 What, yeah. what I would call the phase transition, not yeah. the reconstruction. Yeah. Um, yeah, the uniqueness threshold gives the right transition and uh, and that it's thresholds on trees that give sort of the worst case analysis for general graphs. Um, also, I was thinking that this picture of a very strange DNA, but they're actually gadgets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully your DNA doesn't look like that. But uh, <laughs> well, you've got DNA. I'm a very strange guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the the proof involves uh, uh, the proof involves understanding sort of the hardcore model on random deregular bipartite graphs, which become the, the gadgets of the proof, and uh, connecting them together appropriately, you can uh, do a reduction from uh, max cut um, and actually solve max cut exactly, so um, show the hardness of approximation result without using the PCP theorem, just because it's hardness of approximating for a counting problem. Um, so the, the threshold in the theorem is the uniqueness one, but ideas from the reconstruction threshold play a, a key role in the proof. Um, and essentially, the relevant Markov models, so the, the local distribution of the hardcore model in these random bipartite graphs, looks like a, a hardcore model which is in the non-reconstruction regime, but also in the non-uniqueness regime. So there are some configurations on the nth level which give you a non-trivial amount of information about the root. And so you can ask, what, how likely are those? And they turn out to be really, really unlikely, sort of doubly exponentially unlikely in the depth. And this is, in a sense, uh, one of the key estimates in the proof, uh, because it allows you to essentially show that a pretty large collection of vertices are conditionally independent, uh, given uh, some, some event you're conditioning on. The fact that you're in this intermediate range, yeah. you, you are that. Uh, yeah, well, okay, so it's not, it's not exactly this hardcore measure. It's, it's, this is the translation invariant one. The measures that um, we um, are relevant in this problem are the ones essentially where you condition on. Uh, are ones where the even and odd vertices sort of have different um, marginal probabilities. So that's kind of naturally in the uh, in the non-reconstruction regime because essentially because it's sort of the the measure is extremal in some sense. So it's not a convex combination of other uh, possible measures, um, and that's not exactly a Markov model, or at least the, the Markov transition kernels are, are different on the sort of even edges or the odd edges. Um, so it's kind of naturally in the non-reconstruction regime, but because lambda is bigger than the uniqueness threshold, it's also uh, you are in the situation where a, a boundary condition can affect, can affect the root. Uh, and so knowing that sort of was sort of central in showing that sort of a, a polynomial number of vertices uh, you can treat as being conditionally independent. Um, okay. So I see that you again use the, chase, the ancient chase parameter, but not quite because now you have a probability and not an expectation. So uh, or, yeah, or is so it the hardcore model the same because there are only two uh, states? No, this is this is really looking at the champ. So this probability is very, this is really looking at the tails of the distribution of the posterior probability rather than 
its expectation. Mm. Um. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I thought I'd briefly mention a couple of other things I'm interested in. Um, so most of this talk was on uh, sort of stochastic processes on trees, but I've also looked at various network questions. Uh, actually, a couple of years ago, I gave a talk here about exponential random graphs. Um, I've also, uh, this was work with Barmidi and Bressler. Uh, so these were models from um, sociologists have used to model social networks with more triangles that to try and incorporate more triangles than you'd otherwise expect. Um, but we showed that actually, at least for a wide range of parameters, the uh, sort of graph limit was just the same as the limit of erdos renyi random graphs. So, uh, so they don't really serve their purpose in that in that way. Um, and so, I've also looked at questions involved, like essentially the phylogenetic equivalent to, to general to reconstructing general mark of random fields um, and limits of sequences of dense graphs conditioned on their degree distribution. Um, uh, one of, and I guess one of my main other interests, which I haven't talked about at all, uh, is uh, the sort of mixing time of Markov chains, uh, particularly for the Glauber dynamics of the easing model recently and with, with work um, with E.R. Lubetsky from uh, the Redmond lab, we proved a number of uh, conjectures about this, including, uh, I just mentioned, cutoff at high temperatures and uh, polynomial time mixing at the critical temperature, sort of utilizing new results from uh, SLE. And, uh, and most recently, some new results in the low temperature easing model with plus boundary conditions, also with Martinelli and Toninelli. Okay, and so, this, this middle one, yeah. so you prove there's a different polynomial at the threshold from, so you have strict bounds that the, the power of the polynomial is higher at the critical point than away from it? Um, because that would be so slowing down. Yeah, so it's, um, <coughs> So I guess if you look at the continuous time version of it, of then for an n by n box, it's it would just be logarithmic at high temperatures. So at least logarithm. So if you think of the number of updates you need to do per vertex, whereas it becomes like it's strictly polynomial at the critical temperature, and there were it was already known that there were lower bounds that it was at least polynomial. So um, and we showed the upper bounds. Um, yeah. Is it slowest at the critical temperature? No. No, no. it gets even slower. It gets slower. exponentially <laughs> slower at, at low temperatures. Uh, okay, anyway, uh, I'm also interested in some other things which I'd be happy to talk about while I'm here. And uh, thanks for listening. trying to understand uh, these weren't so these weren't our models these um, this was a, a model of networks where you weight graphs according to sort of various sub graph counts so um, now these were models that were used by actual sociologists not just yeah. mathematicians yeah. Right. Uh, Stanley or Wasserman uh, well, he, so he gave the original talk that we heard of, uh, but Mark Han Hancock, or the... Wasserman well, is, is definitely yeah. a sociologist. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. 
and and there are so these are models that trying to incorporate give more weight to more clustering, clustering more triangles basically. yeah the more clustering than the typical Erdős Renyi random brown yeah uh, yeah so I guess our results were either that either we could show that it doesn't have okay there are more okay there are two ways you can really add more triangles to a graph one is you can have more structure uh, that and sort of dense cliques with more triangles or the other way is you can just have a graph with a higher density of edges and we our analysis sort of found that these models were just basically increasing the edge density to and that was the um, oh, so which isn't isn't what you really want to incorporate uh, I see. So he mm. had models which did have mm. higher clustering, but you're saying you showed mm. that they had higher clustering simply because it, in, in, without realizing it, increased yeah. the overall edge density. Yeah. Have you, have you had any conversations, any response from, from sociologists who are working on social network theory? Uh, not really. No, we haven't. <laughs> we. Um, you should give them a call. Like yeah. So I know. Yeah, so, so Percy Diaconis and Shurov Chatterjee have done some sort of have extended our results recently, or and uh, I know they've talked more with the statisticians on sociology, well, or the people who've looked at these models. Um, so does do people like Mark Luhmann know this, or do they not know this? I don't know. So he he. He also has um, maybe non-rigorous results about versions of these models. Yeah, so yes, that's, right. that, that's yeah. why Christian is I saying yeah. that because Mark is rigorous. used <laughs> a lot of, mm. of souped-up exponential random graph models, and I wonder yeah. whether his models also mm. have this With some property or not. And Mark would probably be in a good position at least mm. to understand your result. Yeah, some like these kind of things seem like you could have even get insight by simulation. I mean, well, just run the uh, sample uh, from so the, the, the other. So the other result was that in the in <laughs> for the range of it's parameters that we, efficient. so for the range of parameters that we couldn't analyze, uh, we showed that that there were MCMC algorithms, or the at least the typical ones used didn't sample from the distributions. Uh, so they could so have misled themselves right. by doing simulations. Yeah. Is right. what so, you're so I, I mean, okay. I guess, I guess to be fair, there are they also have various, like, sort of. It had been previously sort of empirically observed that these models have problems, and both in or particularly in the mixing side of things. And there are also more complicated versions of these, which are, I think, um, conveniently. Complicated enough that we can't analyze those. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I'm um, that. I, yeah. So that's sort of the state of things as far as I know. 